Sweet 16 is here, and it's a Maui Invitational rematch. Purdue, Gonzaga, the first time these two teams played, 73-65. But Gonzaga did jump on Purdue early, led at halftime. Uh, they had a nine-point lead with just two minutes left in the first half of that game. Purdue, if I'm remembering accurately here, and I'll, I'll fact-check this with these guys, Purdue really steamrolled them in the first 10 minutes of the second half. Uh, the offense got going. Zach Eady was pretty much unstoppable. Purdue ended up winning the game by 10, a game where they only shot 23% from three, only made four three-pointers, and still won the game by double digits. That may bode well with the way Purdue's offense has been playing thus far in the tournament. Maybe you're expecting a better performance, but it won't be easy because this Gonzaga team is playing lights out right now. Top five in the country since February 1st. Look like a completely different team than I think they were in Maui when Dusty Stromer was in the starting lineup. Connor Hope is here. Uh, Connor Hope is our resident Gonzaga fan, although you have some Purdue heartstrings ties as well, I believe. Uh, first off, where are you at mentally coming into this game? Uh, I've I've resigned myself, and we can we can talk about why. Um, Gonzaga's looked good. They have looked good uh, in this tournament, but Purdue's looked like the best team in the country in this tournament, and and we know why. They have the best player in the country. They have the best three point shooting team in the country. Uh, when you have the combination, that combination, it's going to be really hard for teams to beat you. Um, and we can get into how the Zags match up, but you're right. The first 10 minutes of that second half, uh, Purdue won 22 to 10, uh, coming out of that halftime break. And then they just continued to, to put points on. I think they won the, the final 10 minutes by three. Uh, but when you can roll over a team like Gonzaga, in that way early on. And I know both teams have kind of changed um, maybe Gonzaga more so than Purdue. Um, Mark Few's going to have his hands full trying to, to stop this Purdue offensive attack. Yeah. Tough. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done. Cart, you got the Lance Jones Jersey around your neck. How you feeling? Uh, the reason I put that on is because Connor had a Gonzaga hat on. So I feel like we just needed some type of just Purdue representation going on here. I'm not going to put it on because Lance hasn't been playing well as of late, but um yeah, this this game, you know, it, I, I, it there's two sides of it for me. Obviously, you have the this is the same Gonzaga team that it was early in the year. A lot of the teams aren't the same team that they were early in the year. That's one of the great things about college basketball. With that said, you know, Gonzaga, yes, has been playing some good basketball, but Purdue right now is playing better basketball, like Connor pointed out, and the thing I had to take a step back with with the Gonzaga team is that they did look great in the first game, but like in the first two games, but also like they beat McNeese State. Like McNeese State was the fun, pretty Will Wade pick that team. Everyone thinks Gonzaga's bad, bet against Mark Few, and that came back and bit you in the ass. They then beat a Kansas team that their head coach checked out a month ago. Their best player, Kevin McCuller, checked out a month ago. Uh, they were a shell of themselves. They started Nick Timberlake. So it's like where are is Gonzaga really playing that well because the last time I actually saw Gonzaga too I mean that and they had some moments during the season weren't as good they turned it around a little bit had that win over St. Mary's St. Mary's also put belt of ass to them when it came to the WCC title game so it's like I, I'm, I'm trying to differentiate is Gonzaga really playing that much better or was it just like they're they were playing bad before so they really had nowhere else but to go up it's still Bill South though Right, like you, you always say it's still Bill Self in March. Yeah, uh, it it's still Bill Self if Bill Self wants to be there. I had no clue that Bill Self had checked out a month ago, which he made that very well known. <laughs> All right, Con Connor, what's your read on this? Is it more the draw that they had, or is it more Gonzaga's really playing at this high level? It's probably a a combination of both. Um, over the last, well, I guess since the beginning of February, Gonzaga's had the number two offense in the country uh, per Torvik. They've been playing really well. You've started to see in games where Ryan Nemhart doesn't get over his skis, this Gonzaga team rolls. I think what you saw in that title game was St. Mary's control the pace. Ryan Nemhart try and, try and push the issue a little bit too much. Uh, and it led to a lot of mistakes for, for Gonzaga. But in the game against McNeese, in the game against Kansas, Gonzaga, Gonzaga really controlled that pace from tip to finish. And that's why you saw Nemhard get all those assists. That's why you saw 
Graham EK relatively quiet in both those games, but making a difference when it mattered, opening up the floor for his team when he was on the floor, obviously sat most of that first half against Kansas came out in the second half uh, and, you know, put Hunter Dickinson in the spin cycle on one possession really dictated what happened in the front court. And as I've, as I've held the entire season, Gonzaga loses games when they're outmatched in the front court. Uh, this Purdue game is, is, is a game like that, but that I thought the Kansas game might be a game like that. And they really uh, pushed the issue and proved that that front court was better than Hunter Dickinson and uh, or at least the Hunter Dickinson that showed up that day. And so uh, they've been playing really well since, you know, from that game in Rupp onwards. Uh, but I do think that there is an opportunity for a team to, if they can dictate the pace and slow the game down, to allow a guy like Ryan M. Hard to make mistakes and, and really open up an opportunity for Purdue to just roll. Yeah, Purdue is the ultimate mismatch in the front court team, obviously, this season when you have Zach Eady. And uh, I've been screaming about it on Twitter. What Zach Eady's doing in this tournament is unprecedented. I mean, he is putting up numbers that match the best big men we've seen in two decades for 40 minute games in the first half of both of his first two games in this run. It's insane. And the same way you can do the Gonzaga, who did they play thing? I think you can do that with Purdue. Obviously, you play a 16 seed that you let hang around the first 20 minutes. And then Utah State, Mountain West concerns right now. I thought that was going to be a tough matchup for Purdue. I give all of the credit to Purdue for that one. But if you want to play the competition game, you could play it with them. Looking back to the first time these two teams played, um, one thing that jumps out to me here is that Braden Smith and Lance Jones were pretty good in this game. Both had 13 points. Uh, now, we've seen Braden Smith kind of blossom into a superstar since then. Lance Jones has been struggling with his shot. He's a little inconsistent. And those two guys combined to only go one for seven from three in the first game. But they were feasting inside the arc. Braden Smith was six for seven from two-point range in that game. Lance Jones was five for eight. He's kind of settled into a role where he just jacks a bunch of threes. So immediately I circled like, oh, Lance Jones shot eight two-point attempts. That feels a little weird. Is there something about Gonzaga defensively that opened the door for the little Purdue guards to have success inside the arc last game, Connor? And I guess like, how are you guys going to deal with Purdue in general near the basket in this game, both with Zach Eady and with the other guys? Mark Few has made a point over the last few years and, and it's continued this year to switch everything defensively. Uh, which gives you the opportunity to have mismatches like Lance Jones is probably going to be defended by a Ben Gregg or a Graham EK at points in this game, because that's just how Gonzaga plays defense. The past couple of years, you've seen Gonzaga defensively uh, slow on rotations, give up a lot of threes. Uh, they tried to, to force it to the liability from the perimeter. Uh, there is none of that for Purdue. They all shoot well, except for Zach Eady from three. So, and even Zach Eady is 50% from three, uh, although only on two attempts. Uh, I think Gonzaga defensively plays in such a way that they can start to start their offense early. And that really hurts them um, somewhat defensively. And look, they're, top 50 this year defensively, but that's not going to be good enough to slow down Purdue. If Purdue's hitting shots, Gonzaga loses this game. Uh, and so they're going to have to get the mismatch. I think the interesting, almost the mismatch both ways offensively is whoever, you know, whoever matches up against Ben Gregg for Purdue because, or Anton Watson, um, cause Purdue's going to have to have a guard, one of their three guards defend one of the three bigs for Gonzaga, uh, both Watson and Ben Gregg can shoot the ball, but they're also really tough and really strong inside and vice versa. Anton Watson or Ben Gregg is going to have to check Fletcher lawyer or Lance Jones defensively, which is going to go open up. I think a lot of opportunities to maybe beat them with the ball and, and drive at the rim. So <clears throat> that to me, that matchup at the three uh, is going to be really interesting. But at the end of the day, the way that Purdue passes the ball, the way that they share the ball, the way that they hunt the best shot, um, I think matches up well with what Gonzaga does defensively, which is, you know, still dominate the paint, get the rebound and go. 
but they don't necessarily make quick rotations and defend the perimeter as well as a team needs to against Purdue. And Purdue's making shots lately. That's the thing, right? Like, Cart, we, we've been talking, this is the number one three-point shooting team in the country now. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, if you... If you look at that second half, because because I saw some people saying, oh, Matt Painter was running up the score. They scored 57 points. Zach Eady only had two. Braden Smith only had two. You look at you look at the subs, the players that subbed out in this game. And I texted this to my brother, who is a Purdue grad. Zach Eady subbed out at the 12 minute mark. Braden Smith at the 942 mark. Fletcher Lawyer at the 820 mark. TK Art 630. Mason Gillis at 548. Lance Jones at 443. Cam Heidi at 313. Like they were subbing out super early and still put up 57 points and a half. Yeah, it's insane. And the guys off the bench are giving them good minutes right now. Like Colvin was hitting shots. He had three threes. Heidi is really doing some things. Like I, I don't want to give them too much credit because it's easy when you're already up 20. But like. They have guys deep into this roster that can come in and hit shots. If they're struggling to hit shots, like if Lance Jones starts 0 for 3 from 3, if Fletcher Lawyer's 0 for 3 early, you have options this year to maybe give you a boost offensively that you didn't have last year. Um, Cart, what's – like what do they need to feel comfortable that this is a no-doubt win from a Purdue perspective? Is it like an ED – number that he needs to hit is it Braden Smith or Lance or Fletcher showing up like what do they need the thing is and this is why I like Purdue in this game I think the path to them winning this game feels I don't know it doesn't feel like easy of course don't tell me to go tweet this from a Walmart parking lot Matt Painter but like a lot of the domination of Gonzaga and their offense has a lot to do with the fact that EK had a run in that second part of the WCC a conference play where like he was putting up ED numbers. Like he was putting up like 25 and 12 a game. And that was part, part of it. I don't think that he has the ability to do that against a guy like Zach ED. That's the thing. So you're going to need guards to make plays and guards to make shots. And some of those are going to have to be tough shots. And, uh, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or if I, if I should see this another way, but, I don't necessarily consider Gonzaga guards to be tough shot makers. Like Nolan Hickman is not a tough shot maker. Nebhard is good and he does make tough shots. Don't get me wrong. He is probably the tough shot maker of the group, but they don't have those kind of tough shot makers. And and another thing I wanted to point out here, Greg, that you pointed out that like big 10 play, obviously there's a lot of big 10 teams that Purdue was able to beat up on. When you really look at this offensive surge by Gonzaga, like starting with that Kentucky game, awful defense. Loyola Marymount, not a good defense. Pacific, not a good defense. Portland, not a good de- Like they're putting up these big numbers against teams that aren't good defensively. And yes, that's who they have to play. That's who's in the conference. But all those teams that I just listed, they're all giving up they, on average 75 points a game. Some of those teams, 80 points a game. So it's like, it, and it worked because EK was just bullying people and being a monster every and like we like to say gee everyone's a monster until zach Eady walks through the door it's not easy to be a dominant big playing against zach Eady. and i just can can ek do it i think he can because he's talented like don't get me wrong the likelihood of it happening though i think is on the lower end probably here's my flip on this uh so I I don't think there's much of a chance Gonzaga has an answer to stop Purdue. I don't. I just uh, personnel wise, I think it's such a nightmare. Like Connor said, they want to switch. I don't think you can switch this team. Edie should destroy them. To me, there's a very good chance that Gonzaga can do the same offensively to Purdue, though. Like this, this could be a very high scoring game to me, a very entertaining watch. And I think that's Gonzaga's best chance if you're looking for like a path of how does this game get interesting late I think it's like in the high 80s to 90s and Gonzaga can't miss you did mention okay it's competition that they were torching at the end of the year yes Kansas isn't the greatest defensive team obviously but what they did to Hunter Dickinson in that second half just destroying him by making him guard ball screen situations guard the perimeter a little bit they were feasting on that right they can do that to Edie they can 100% do that to Edie. And we know Edie likes to sit in drop coverage, and you have to have answers for that. You have to have guards who can hit some shots. I, I do think there's a world where that happens here. 
Um, and just looking through the last month, go back to February 26th, Gonzaga's the third best team in the country per Torvik, third best offense, 38th defense. Purdue's seventh in the country in that span, ninth best offense, 20th best defense. So, like, caliber-wise for a month, they're similar. Gonzaga's defense isn't that far behind Purdue's. Their offense is better than Purdue's. To me, that's the formula is, like, can Gonzaga – literally score 100 points if needed in this game and go toe-to-toe with Purdue and outscore them. Do you think that's the right read, Connor? It It is. And I think if you look at Gonzaga's wins against Kansas and their wins against Kentucky, and it, and if you look at Stephen Carr's Twitter, a brilliant video, uh, against Kentucky, they found out that their middle brawl screen concept was working and they ran that every single possession and Coach Cal didn't change. Against Kansas in the second half, and, and even towards the end of the first half, they ran the same roll and replace concept every single possession. And Bill Self didn't adjust, didn't change anything, just allowed Hunter Dickinson to get cooked by Braden Huff. And Mark Few's going to find something that works in this game offensively against Purdue. And the, the question is, and this is the question we've had about Matt Painter his entire career to this point, will he adjust defensively enough to force Gonzaga to switch up their offense? Because if he does what Cal and Bill Self, two of the best coaches in the country, if he does what they did, Gonzaga has a chance. But if if Matt Painter forces Gonzaga to switch up their offense late, maybe even after halftime, right? And and, and they come out, they they do things defensively that slows down this Gonzaga pick and roll. Um, I think they have, you know, they they, ha- they have a chance to just put Gonzaga away early. But if they don't adjust, Gonzaga and Mark Few are going to abuse whatever works. Mark Few is one of the best offensive coaches in the country. Uh, he's proven that year in and year out. And Gonzaga is, they are not they don't have tough shot make. I think the only tough shot makers you can look at are both front court players. I think Anton Watson can make, can make tough shots. I think Ben Gregg, and I, and I messaged you this, Greg, Ben Gregg is the only player on Gonzaga who I would consider having that dog in him. He just... He makes all the tough plays. He makes all the tough shots. He gets the offensive boards. He does whatever needs to happen. And it seems like, you know, he goes out with two fouls, comes back into that game against McNeese and eight, a quick eight points, quick, tough eight points. Uh, the guards are, if you don't respect us, we're going to make you respect us shot makers. They, they make open shots. We saw that against McNeese where McNeese was kind of dropping off Ryan Nemhard to double Graham EK and Nemhard was sinking threes because they weren't respecting him. Um, but if, if we've no, if Matt, if what Matt Painter has indicated so far in this tournament is true, Purdue respects their hell out of their opponents. They're in the NCAA tournament I think Matt Painter is going to come in with a defensive scheme that respects Nolan Hickman, respects Ryan Nemhard, and really puts the pressure on that backcourt to make tough shots, like you said, Greg. And I don't know if Gonzaga can make those shots. So um, we'll see. We'll see. But both of these coaches are, hell, uh, you know, fantastic coaches. And it's going to be about who makes the adjustments in the second half. And I really believe that. I think it more than any game in the Sweet 16, this game comes down to coaching to me. And that's there, there's some matchups we think teams just have big advantages in. To me, Iowa State, Illinois is a fun competitive game, but to me, it's not like like we know what the coaches are going to do. They're going to play the way they want to play, and that's it. There's not many adjustments to be made. This one is like, okay, how are you going to guard Edie? How is Purdue going to try and guard Gonzaga's offense? And what actions are they running? Like it just it's a fascinating, like if one of these coaches wins this game. It could be because they won the head-to-head coaching matchup more than any other matchup here. Round the horn very quickly. Mark Few versus Matt Painter in this game. Which coach do you trust more? Card, I'll have you go first. Few. Connor? I trust Few more, but Matt Painter has the two best players on the court. And if big game Fletch shows up, he probably has three of the best five or six. So uh, he has more tools in the toolbox. Uh, but as a coach head-to-head, I still trust Few more. I do too, and I feel weird that consensus is all three of us and none of us are taking Painter, but I think that's a big element of this game on paper is exactly what you said. Go find the Twitter thread. Mark Few has been torching their biggest games with just finding what works and spamming it, and the other coaches don't adjust. I think we could 100% see that. If Gonzaga can find something early in this game that works, 
we'll see. If you put it on Painter to adjust, I am curious what he will do in the big moment of this season. Uh, we are presented by my bookie. All things in March on the Sleepers channel are brought to you by MyBookie. They are our go-to sports book. They have everything you could possibly want from player props to futures, odds, boosts, expert picks and predictions, and more. We have a special offer, promo code SLEEPERS. You can get a deposit match up to $1,000. There's a link in the description of this video. Promo code SLEEPERS. Go take advantage of that. Let's do predictions real quick, boys. Uh, what is the line for this game? Anybody have it handy? Uh, five and a half is what I'm showing right now. Purdue. Five and a half. Ken, Ken Palm has Purdue by just four. So my bookie has Purdue by five and a half. Carter, what would you bet here? What's the prediction? Uh, I'm betting Purdue. I think Purdue wins this game 83 to 76. Connor? I'm going to take Purdue. Purdue has the best front court player and, and TKR playing well. Um, Mason Gillis, obviously, we know what he can give you in the front court. I think it might be a little bit higher scoring. I'm going to take Purdue 86, Gonzaga 77. I think it's high scoring. I think that benefits Gonzaga. I think this is a very close game for the first 25 minutes. And then I think we see the the pressure of Zach Eady getting a good look nearly every single possession, wearing down the Gonzaga guards as the game goes on. I'll take Purdue by double figures, just barely, maybe an 11 and 12 point game. Thank you to Connor Hope for being here. Thank you to Connor Hope for all his help throughout the month of March. He's given us a lot this season on the Sleepers channel. You can find him at Heat Check CBB, uh, and we'll have a recap up of this game as soon as it's over.